7. I think that today we have reached the last four of the spiritual gifts. Believe me, I have really been trying to abbreviate every week. And yet it has taken us, this is the 14th week when we have been dealing with the gifts that God gave to the church so that we might edify one another. And we have paralleled it with what we have seen in the book of Exodus as we've read it this morning where God called Moses, gifted Moses, and gave Moses a responsibility in relation to his people, the children of Israel. And God has called each of us, gifted each of us, and given to each of us a responsibility in relation to his people, the church. You have, according to the New Testament, multiple gifts, not the sign gifts, for the sign gifts have passed away, but more than one of the 15 service gifts are yours if you have trusted Christ as your Savior and been indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. 
When you received your salvation as a gift from God, he gave you another gift. He gave you the Holy Spirit, who indwells you permanently and abides with you forever. He will not leave you, as the Holy Spirit came upon people in the Old Testament and then later left them, such as King Saul. Jesus said he will abide with you forever. And so God not only gave you the gift of salvation, it's not your choice, it was his. God also gave you the Holy Spirit, that was his choice, not yours. And he has likewise given you spiritual gifts so that you might edify, which means build up, the church, the body of Christ. The gift at which we've been most recently looking is the gift of giving. We completed the first two-thirds of that gift last week. And we remember that the gift of giving is an every believer gift. You have that gift because you're commanded to use it. And God would not command you to do something that he does not likewise empower you to do. It enables every believer to provide money and genuine need-based material goods to needy believers cheerfully, generously, freely, and in simplicity. And we've talked about the different things that it is not. We contrasted it with Old Testament tithing. Giving is not the same. Giving is not the same as the law of offerings. Giving is something that was addition to tithing under the law. We saw there are many different kinds of offerings, periodic offerings, daily offerings, Sabbath days, new moons, seven feasts, and so on, that Israel was required to bring under the law, and we no longer have to do those things because they have been fulfilled in Christ. And then we saw the free will offerings, or the voluntary offerings of the Old Testament, which were brought out of a heart filled with love, not because it was required, but because the giver gave in love. And that's what we saw was most closely paralleled to giving in the New Testament. We saw that Romans 12.8 told us, first of all, that it was to be done in simplicity. We studied that word, saw that it means without folds, where you would hide a dagger or something else. We compared that with other passages of the New Testament, where we saw that Romans 12.8 is telling us three things. Don't pretend to give what you have not given. God called that lying to the Holy Ghost with Ananias and Sapphira. Number two, don't have a hidden agenda or ulterior motive in your giving. And three, don't try to get glory for yourself through your giving. The second thing we saw was that God requires not merely the correct motive, but he also requires the correct attitude in giving. God loves a cheerful giver, 2 Corinthians 9.7. And we saw that that word there is the word for hilarious. It's the word, in fact, from which we get our word hilarious. New Testament giving is a joyful activity for the spirit-filled Christian who is walking by faith. It should be a joy to give because you see that God is going to take that and use it for his glory. The second thing that that passage lets us know is that it's a contrast because the Old Testament law said nothing about attitude or motives in relation to the tithes and offerings. They were a required obligation. And third, we saw the illustration of that kind of giving with the church at Macedonia, which gave to the persecuted church at Jerusalem. In 2 Corinthians 8, 1 and following, we saw that the Macedonian believers gave in seven specific ways that should characterize our giving today. It says they gave during a great time of persecution. They gave with overabounding joy. They gave during a deep time of poverty. They gave extravagantly and generously. They gave more than could be reasonably expected so that it meant they ended up with some needs themselves. And we pointed out that that was really the key in the list of things that Paul says about them because it means they had learned to trust the Lord rather than trusting their money to meet their needs. Then Paul says they gave themselves first to the Lord 
And then finally he says, they gave themselves to him, the one who had been their mentor in the Lord. And the take-home principle that we gathered from all those passages of scripture was that don't look for ways to reduce your giving, look for ways to increase your giving. Third, we move to some other questions concerning New Testament giving. We talked about why we take our offerings on Sunday, and the answer is 1 Corinthians 16, 1 through 3 commands it. It's not a suggestion, it's a command in that passage of scripture. We saw there were five principles related to corporate giving on Sunday. It was to be the first day of the week. It was to be pre-planned and systematic. It applies to every believer, uh, and it relates to money, because it says so in verse 1. It was the collection that was taken on the first day of the week. Fourth, we saw that it was not based on the tithe principle, but on how God has prospered. How has God prospered you through the week? And finally, it was there were to be no supplemental offerings in the midweek, because Paul says that there be no gatherings when I come. No surprise corporate offerings. Fourth, we looked at the question, why do we pay our pastor? Paul explained the reasons in Galatians 6 and in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We did first a study on the Old Testament Levites and priests to see how God paid them and noted that it ended up 120% of the average Israelites' tithes in the Old Testament, plus the very best portions of a number of the different kinds of offerings that were brought. This was the priests and Levites, and we talked about the five reasons that they received an enhanced salary, if you will. And then in verse 14, Paul explained that those reasons are parallel as to why a pastor gets paid today. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. And Paul reminded young Timothy, who was both an evangelist and a pastor, concerning the amount that that should be, in 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18, that the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially, that's the word malista, by that I mean to say, they who labor in the word and doctrine. And then he quotes Deuteronomy 25, 4, and the words of our Lord Jesus in Luke 10, 7, and Matthew 10, 10. The word double honor we saw literally meant double pay. The word honor is time, which means value or money paid. Paul did not take advantage of that, although he had the right to do so, but he chose not to take advantage of it so that he could set an example and so that he could continue his ministry to the Corinthians. He says so in verse 15. But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be so done unto me, for it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glorying void. Fifth, then we talked about some of the other areas of personal giving that are in addition to, not in place of, corporate giving. Giving to missions above and beyond corporate giving of the church, not in place of. Giving to needy brothers and sisters instead of just saying to them, be warmed and filled. Providing for aged and widowed parents. Providing for widows in the church, and so on. There are many other areas where God may call upon you to exercise individual giving to meet the needs of someone else or participate in an additional ministry, not in place of, but in addition to the ministry of the local church. And sixth, we ended with the New Testament passages that tell us that the gift of giving does not require you to give anything to sinning brothers who refuse to work to earn a living. And the reason that Paul gives is so that they will be ashamed. The reason you don't support those kind of people who refuse to work is so that they will be ashamed and repent and be brought back into fellowship. And so today we finish with the final four service gifts. The first of those is the gift of ministration. The gift of ministration enables every believer, again this is an every believer gift, to humbly serve other believers. Very short, very easy definition. The gift of ministration enables every believer to humbly serve 
other believers. This is a frequently unused gift, especially in a church that is a proud church or a rich church. Uh, people find it very difficult in contexts such as proud and rich churches to exercise humble service toward others. Notice several things about this, by the way. It is stated as a spiritual gift in Romans 12, 7. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministry, or he that teacheth on teaching. That's the list of spiritual gifts that you have in Romans chapter 12, um, starting in verse 6. That's a gift found in verse 7. But notice several things about it. First of all, it is not the gift of administration, but the gift of ministration. Some folks look at that and they think, oh, I've got the gift of administration, so I should be busy running things at the church. <laughs> well, you should be deeply involved in the church, but involved in ministering, in serving others. In fact, the Greek word for ministration is a word that means the humble service of a servant or slave. That's the same Greek word from which we get our word that is translated deacon. The noun form is diakonos. The verbal form to minister is diakoneo. You can hear the word deacon in that particular word. The gift of ministration implies hard work of a non-glorious type. There are no kudos, no praise for folks who exercise this gift. And I know that there are some of you in this church that have truly exercised that gift. You do it quietly, humbly. Nobody else here knows. I know when it happens, but uh, almost nobody else knows it. And I praise God that you are willing to do that. The various humble items of service that take place around this church. Of course, the best example of this is our Lord Jesus Christ. And as I've said before, all of the spiritual gifts reflect the character of Christ. Because they come from the Holy Spirit. And our Lord Jesus Christ, being God, was filled with the Spirit here on earth. The scripture states so. And so if you want to see an illustration of how any of these gifts should be exercised, look to Christ. He's the one who ultimately receives the praise for those gifts which he has given you through his spirit. Mark chapter 10, verse 43 through 45. But so shall it not be among you. They've been arguing about who was the greatest. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. That takes us to the word for the gift of ministration. He shall be your minister. You want to be great? Be a minister. Oh, we're not talking about the guy who stands in the pulpit. The reason that ministers got the name minister was because they faithfully and humbly served the church. Minister is not a title of grandiose glory. It's a title of humble service. Jesus says, it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be the servant of all. For the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. There's our word again. And to give his life a ransom for many. All of the spiritual gifts reflect the character of our Lord Jesus Christ. And those which we think least highly of, God thinks most highly of. And those that we as human beings tend to put on a pedestal, apostle, prophet, healings, miracles, tongues, interpretation of tongues, knowledge. Paul says those are lesser gifts because they don't serve the church. Note well, the gift of exhortation is not the same thing as the gift of criticism. That's our next gift. Pay careful attention to the difference between exhortation and criticism. The definition of exhortation, the gift of exhortation, enables every believer to remind, 
warn, comfort, or commend other believers on the basis of Bible doctrine. Exhortation does four different things. We find this gift word used in those four contexts in the New Testament. Reminding, warning, comforting, and commending. It's listed in Romans 12.8 as a spiritual gift. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. The list of spiritual gifts. Too many folks thinking that they are exercising exhortation are merely being critics. It's well to note that nobody ever built a monument to a critic. But lots of monuments have been built to brave men who have had the courage to go where others feared to tread. The gift of exhortation is a very wonderful gift because it shows a special aspect of the work of the Holy Spirit. The root word from which the term exhortation is translated is parakaleo. Now, if you've been with us any length of time, you know that the verbal adjective parakletos is translated comforter, and it's a term used by our Lord Jesus Christ to describe the ministry of the Holy Spirit to us. Jesus used that term, the same word that we find here in its verbal form. He used that in John chapter 14, the upper room discourse. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. Let me just pause for a moment and mention something. When you see the word another in the New Testament, there are two different Greek words that underlie the word another. One Greek word means another of the same kind. That's alos. The other Greek word that is translated another means another of a different kind. That is heteros. You know of heterodoxy. That's doctrine that is different doctrine. Alos is the same kind. Heteros is another kind. And Paul warns the Galatians to be careful that they might have received another Jesus, another gospel, another spirit. Those it's another Jesus of a different kind. Another gospel of a different kind. Another spirit of a different kind. But Jesus is here comparing the Holy Spirit to himself in John 14. I will send you another of the same kind of comforter that you've had. Jesus has been their comforter while here on earth. Now he is going back to heaven and he promises to send the Holy Spirit. And so he sends another comforter of the same kind that he may abide with you forever, the Holy Spirit, when you trusted Christ and he indwelt you, will never leave you. He is another comforter of the same kind of comforter. He's a divine comforter, just like our Lord Jesus Christ. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. But when the Comforter, here's our word again, he uses it four times in this passage, but when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, and so we have the doctrine of the procession of the Spirit from both Christ and from the Father. It is the doctrine that caused the split between the Eastern Orthodox Catholics and the Western Catholics who are seated at Rome as to whether or not the Spirit proceeded from just the Father or from the Father and the Son. It was called the Filioque Controversy, if you would like to look that up at some time. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter, the Paraclete, the Paracletos, but we call in English the Paraclete, 
will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. Now that's a fascinating word when you break it down. Parakaleo is a compound of two Greek words. Para, and we have that like in our word parallel, means things that are alongside one another, and kaleo, which means to call. And so the paraclete is the one who is called alongside of us to help us in our times of difficulty. Thus, this wonderful gift that we have here is to call alongside. This gift of exhortation is not the gift of criticism. It is where we who have that gift are called alongside to minister to other believers. We find that that is a term that was used, for example, in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ twice when there was a miracle of large catch of fish once at the beginning of his ministry, once following the resurrection, that the boat was too laden with fish and was about to sink. And so they called alongside their companion boat to help them with this huge catch of fish. That's what the gift of exhortation is about. Another brother or sister beginning to sink under the load and you are called alongside to help them lift that load. Marvelous gift. It's a gift that is of special need in churches where persecution, opposition, or the incursion of fearful things have arisen. For example, the church at Thessalonica had received a false message telling them that they were going to have to go through the Great Tribulation. And that's what Paul is writing about in the opening chapters of 1 Thessalonians. They had received a fearful message. You are going to go through the tribulation. And so they had written to Paul and asked him about it. And Paul wrote to disabuse them of that false doctrine. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 and following, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us so that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Verse 11, Wherefore, comfort, parakaleo. This is the gift of exhortation. It's used in the context of comforting. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. The next gift is the gift of mercy. Oh, a very important spiritual gift. And I've saved some of these, what most folks call the lesser gifts for the end, because God holds them to be so important in a church where there is damage and wounding and need and suffering and discouragement and all the things that we go through, all of us, at some time in our lives. Here's a very important gift. The gift of mercy enables every believer to cheerfully provide practical relief, not mere pity, for suffering believers. Now we read it a moment ago, but I'll read the verse again. You'll see it's in the same verse as the gift of exhortation, the gift of giving, and the gift of ruling. He that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence, and then here is our gift, Romans 12.8. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Only of the few of the gifts have a descriptive adjective going along with them. Where we're told how the gift is supposed to be exercised. Here we are told that he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Now why would he do that? Why does Paul write that we must show mercy with cheerfulness. I think cheerfulness is required because most of the time when we're walking in the flesh, we feel that we have enough problems of our own and don't want to be bothered with the problems of somebody else. But mercy is very clearly, and right here in this verse, is clearly connected to the gift of giving 
in the one-on-one -on -one practical and personal level. He had just talked about, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, and now he says, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Did you note that we are to give in the first Corinthians passage cheerfully, and here we are to show mercy cheerfully. Mercy is also specifically connected to the gift of wisdom, which we have studied before in James 3.17. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy. If you want to exercise the gift of wisdom, remember that the gift of wisdom is full of mercy. The world's kind of wisdom is a very abrasive kind of wisdom. It's a self-centered kind of wisdom. It's a deadly kind of wisdom that cuts and hacks and chops and does everything for the bottom line. The wisdom that is from above is not only pure, but the wisdom from above is full of mercy. Mercy is always practical. It's never theoretical. Listen to this context in James chapter 2. For he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy. When you make decisions, do you exercise mercy? Even when you perhaps discipline children or grandchildren, does the wisdom also show mercy? in your responsibilities at work, when those under you have not quite met up to par, do you show mercy? You see, there's a law of harvest going on here. He shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. Mercy is like a, an insulator. The man who is a merciful man is a man who will receive mercy. And listen to the next verse. We've just been talking about mercy. Remember, mercy is practical. It's cheerful. Verse 14. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he have faith and not works? Can faith save him? this kind of faith, it's a special Greek construction there. That's a fake faith that James is talking about. And he explains, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? You see how closely mercy and giving are tied together here? It's not enough just to say, I really commiserate with you. You know, it's a really sad thing that you don't have food for your next meal. I understand winter's coming on, and man, I see you shivering there. So let me give you God's blessing. Be warm. Be filled. And you provide not those things that are needful. What kind of faith is that? Faith, giving, mercy. We see all three of those things with the church at Macedonia who met the needs of the believers in Jerusalem. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Remember, no giving is given to the lazy brother here in the last verse, we see mercy connected with faith. Now, I hope you see how all these things are tying together, and that's one of the other reasons I brought these in last, these four gifts. The spiritual gifts are interconnected because the body of Christ is interconnected. 
We are members one of another. Did you get that? We're not just members of a church. We are members one of another. Paul tells us that very clearly in 1 Corinthians. Not one member can say to another member, I have no need of you because we are interconnected and all of the spiritual gifts are interconnected as well. Sometimes, and this is an important principle to recognize, we always like to be on the top end, but you know, sometimes we're on the giving and ministering end and sometimes as an interconnected member of the body of Christ we are on the receiving end. Now if you have a proud spirit you will never want to be on the receiving end. But because of the interconnectivity of the gifts and the fact that many of these gifts are every believer gifts just like the body, sometimes you will be inhaling and sometimes you will be exhaling. Part of the time you will be giving out to minister to another believer. Part of the time, because God wants us to learn humility, you will have to be on the receiving end so that other believers will have the joy of ministering to you. That's what the spiritual gifts are all about. And that's why so many are every believer gifts. We move now to our last gift. And praise the Lord, I think we're going to have time to do it. That is the gift of hospitality. This is listed as a spiritual gift in 1 Peter, as we'll see in a moment. And here is its definition. The gift of hospitality is given to every believer. Again, it's an every believer gift, and we'll see it specifically says so in the text. The gift of hospitality is given to every believer to increase love and unity of fellowship in the church, to provide lodging and food for other believers who are in fellowship, and to care for other believers who are suffering persecution or genuine needs. Listen to what Peter says in 1 Peter 4, 8. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. Now that's agape love. And it's not to be blasé, it's to be fervent. It's to be passionate love within the body of Christ. Have fervent charity among yourselves. For charity, that's agape, that's the kind of love that God has for us, that God enables us to have for one another by the Holy Spirit. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another. Here is an illustration of showing fervent charity to the rest of the body. Use hospitality one to another and he gives us a descriptor, without grudging. Does that sound familiar? It suddenly makes you realize that that descriptor was also the same descriptor that was given for our cheerful giving without grudging it. In the same way, he says, you are to exercise hospitality without grudging. Oh, I wish I didn't have to do this. Oh, you mean the Joneses are coming over again? Oh, no. Dear friends, you have this gift. Are you using it? Listen, it says so right here. The very next verse. As every man hath received the gift. Did you get that? As every man hath received the gift. Even so, minister the same one to another as... Oh, we're back to the same concept that we've seen over and over through the gifts. As good stewards of the manifold grace of God. 
Folks, you're not an owner, and neither am I. You are a steward. Do you have a house? It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to Christ. Above all things, have fervent charity. Use hospitality without grudging, as every man hath received the gift. In those three verses, we find these things made clear. If you have a place to live, it's not your own. It belongs to God, and you should be using it cheerfully and on a regular basis for at least one of the three purposes that are stated in the definition. One, to increase love and unity in the church. Number two, to provide food and lodging for godly Christians. Number three, to meet the needs of persecuted and suffering Christians. Hospitality is a restricted gift also. It is restricted to exclude those who teach false doctrine. Second John 1, verses 8 through 11. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. So what's he talking about? He's talking to Christians about receiving a full reward. Implication? You can lose heavenly rewards. You can't lose your salvation, but you can lose things that will last forever. Rewards. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ he hath both the Father and the Son. Now those of you who have been with us in time past know that the doctrine of Christ is the doctrine that deals with the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's given to us in a nutshell in the Gospel. Who Jesus is, both God and man, what Jesus did, died for our sins according to the Scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Anybody who denies any of the four key elements of that is denying the doctrine of Christ. That means Jehovah's, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, these people who go around both those groups to your door, they want to come in and talk to you. They want to run a Bible study in your house. Listen to what he says. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house neither bid him Godspeed. In other words, don't say to him, as we would colloquially say in English, have a nice day. Because you don't want him to have a nice day. He may have a nice day and get the next four or five houses down the street pulled into his cult. You hope he has a miserable day, that he's convicted of his sins, and that he sees the error of that wicked doctrine and pulls out. Now listen to the last verse. For he that biddeth him Godspeed, here is a tough one. He that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. Yes, we are to exercise hospitality. Is there a restriction? Yes. Number one, you don't provide for sinning Christians, so you'll shame them. But number two, especially you don't even invite them in, these apostates who are teaching false doctrine concerning the person and work of Christ, the doctrine of Christ. Let me give you just a few illustrations. We have four more minutes. A few illustrations of hospitality in the Bible. Think of the blessing that that couple of two received when they were on the road to Emmaus and they invited Jesus in for dinner. Think of the blessing they received. Think of the Last Supper. You know, some unknown follower of Jesus prepared a room for Passover and then provided the entire Passover feast for 13 men, the Lord and his disciples. You know, 
the Bible has not chosen to tell us the name of the one who offered that hospitality. But God knows, and God has certainly rewarded him. Think about the blessing that Abraham received when the three strangers stopped by his tent, one of whom was the Lord himself, and the other two were angels on their way to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Because of Abraham's hospitality, God revealed what he was about to do, and because of Abraham's prayer, spared Lot and his two daughters. There's one more incredible reference to hospitality that I really must draw your attention to. It's also connected to the crucifixion, just like the hospitality of those on the road to Emmaus and the hospitable room and feast offered for the Last Supper. It's in John 19, beginning in verse 23. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, it says. They parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture did they cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus, therefore, saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. That is so beautiful. When I read that, I think, how many times have I missed the blessing of hospitality? What a blessing for John to take the aging Mary and care for her for the rest of her natural life. A lot more could be said about hospitality, including the requirement for church leaders to exercise hospitality, the requirement for widows supported by the church to have already exercised hospitality before being taken on the roles of church widows. I'm just going to read these verses without comment. Romans 12:13, Distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality, that's a, con a command in the context of the gifts. It's an every believer gift, Peter told us that. Hebrews 13, 1 and 2. Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware, and Abraham is an illustration of that. 1 Timothy 3.2 A bishop, that's an elder as we've already studied, then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality. And the phrase there literally means addicted to hospitality. He loves it. He enjoys doing it. He is glad every time he can have someone in. Given to hospitality, apt to teach, which means skilled at teaching. Titus 1, 7 and 8. For a bishop, also referring to the elders, must be blameless as the steward of God. Remember, there's stewardship again. Not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of of hospitality. Did you get it? Not just occasional hospitality. A lover of hospitality. A lover of good men. 
sober, just, holy, temperate. 1 Timothy 5, 9 and 10. Let not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years old, sixty years old, having been the wife of one man, well reported of for good works, if she have brought up children, if she has lodged strangers. That's the exercise of hospitality. If she have washed the saints' feet, that's humble service. That's the gift of ministration. If she have relieved the afflicted, that's the gift of mercy and the gift of giving. Here's a woman who has exercised all the practical gifts. If she have diligently followed every good work, and you remember that the New Testament tests for good works are three in number. Number one, works that are done in the power of the Holy Spirit, not the flesh. Number two, works that are done in obedience to the word of God, not humanly concocted humanitarianism. And number three, gifts that are uh, works that are done to the glory of God, the purpose being and the motive being his glory, not our own. Well, we've covered a lot. You definitely do not have any of the sign gifts, apostle, prophet, healings, miracles, tongues, interpretation of tongues, or gift of knowledge. But you do have multiple service gifts. You won't have all of them, but you do have many of them. I wonder if I gave a test right now, how many folks could write down all 15 of the service gifts. Do you know what the service gifts are? The 15 practical service gifts? The gift of evangelist and pastor teacher and teacher and governments and ruling and helps and faith and wisdom, self-control, discerning of spirits, giving, ministration, exhortation, mercy, hospitality. Did you ever write down those gifts as we studied them for 14 weeks? Did you take notes so that you could seriously review and pray about which gifts you should be exercising right now in this body where God has placed you? Did anything stand out to you, especially among those service gifts? Perhaps that's a spiritual gift that you should be cultivating right now. You know, each one of us, myself included, we will all have to give account for the stewardship of our gifts. Even if we, like the unfaithful steward, have chosen to bury our gift in the earth and not use it, so here's our final question. What will you say about the gifts that God has given to you to use when you stand before Christ? Gracious Heavenly Father, again we thank you for your word, for its beauty, for the marvelous gifts that you've given us, the gift of salvation, the gift of your Holy Spirit, the spiritual service gifts whereby we can edify one another and build up the body of Christ. For the long-suffering and kindness and gentleness and tenderness and mercy that you've shown to us when we have been recalcitrant and stubborn and refused to do what you've called us to do and gifted us to do. We repent, Father, of our sin. We look back and see many times in our life where we have failed to exercise the gifts that you have given us, failed to take advantage of the opportunities for service because we had something more interesting and humanly more important to do. Father, we have sinned and we confess it to you. How we thank you that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Father, as we move forward from this point, we pray that you will make us diligent students of your word, diligent members of the body of Christ, faithful in using what you have entrusted to us and empowered us to use. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.